Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us again in another one of our Safer at Home series. Uh, um, I just giving you a little forewarning. Um, it's it's a dark and stormy night here at the at the Schmidt Mansion up in in Plymouth. So um, it's uh, if, if you get uh, if, if you hear some thunder in the background, you would not be uh, misled, and it's probably headed south across the bridge. So I'm just giving you a little forewarning. It's raining pretty good here. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. I um, uh, want to thank our sponsors before we get started. Um, um, Cape Cod Five, uh, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, Martha's Vineyard Savings. I want to thank uh, Eight Cousins Bookseller, who has copies of all of our books. Um, and I uh, want to thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, uh, all of you are members. If you are not, uh, I greatly encourage you to become a member of the Museums on the Green because you help make these, these uh, things possible. And we've been trying to keep them, uh, keep them free for as long as we can. Uh, we're, I know they're free through August. Um, so uh, we, ho we hope you find these entertaining and we hope we get, to get you hooked on them. So uh, uh, I want to thank our guest tonight, Kevin Baker, uh, has written several books and um, he lives in New York City, correct? You're still, you're still in New York? Yep. But, but also was, uh, was raised in Rockport, Mass. So he's got yep. some experience yep. with, with, with being a Massachusetts person. So, um, um, and uh, really looking forward tonight uh, to tonight and again, um, keeping an eye on the weather behind me, but uh, would you welcome Kevin Baker? Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to be on the Cape, if only uh, virtually. I really hope to be here, uh, be there corporeally, but, you know, have to make do as best we can. Uh, so I just, you know, I'm going to talk to you a little tonight about America the Ingenious, uh, this book I wrote and you know the best thing about writing books is that hopefully you learn something and I learned a great deal uh, writing this um, it's the story of how Americans invented developed or learned to exploit so many of the innovations that would shape the modern world but beyond the inventions themselves fascinating as they are what I found even more telling was how things are invented, how invention itself is encouraged and nurtured, at least how it has been encouraged uh, and nurtured in this country in the past. Um, it's easy to say, as I do in my book, that we are a nation of tinkerers. We Americans like to think of ourselves as natural adventurers, risk takers, entrepreneurs. But what does that mean exactly? I'm a believer in American exceptionalism, but as the Marines like to say, um, I, as the Marines like to say, it has to be earned, never given. How did we earn it? How did we do what we did, and how can we get back to doing it right? As the first nation to exist wholly in the modern age, the United States has also existed wholly in that time when making things began to replace simply growing them or extracting them from the earth. We have invented almost everything about America, and we have constantly reinvented almost everything as we deemed it necessary, including our institutions, our customs, our laws, above all, our definition of who is an American and what that means. Now, this is not to say that Americans, as we were taught in grammar school, invented everything. Um, or at least as I was taught in grammar school. Uh, I'm, I'm fourth from the left there in uh, the second row, uh, class of 1830. Um, you who went to school more recently were probably taught something more accurate. Throughout history, very little was invented solely in one nation or by one person working alone. Many of the American inventions I cite here were inspired by ideas, theories, and prototypes from other places and other times. Uh, dry cleaning, by some definitions, uh, goes all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome, where it consisted mostly of dipping togas into public laboratories. This was taxed by local government and provided a steady stream of revenue. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the rotary printing press was invented in America, but China had printing presses going back to the seventh century. Yankees from 
couple of places you'll, you'll have heard of Nantucket uh, and New Bedford came to dominate whaling around the world in the years before the Civil War, using techniques, though, largely borrowed from medieval mat basques. Uh, iron chain suspension bridges were first thrown across the chasms of the Himalayas by Thang Tong Jialpo. Uh, please forgive me if I am not pronouncing that correctly, a Buddhist saint in 1430. Uh, dress codes for engineers were uh, a little more lax then. Uh, the Western world at the outset of the Industrial Age was a particular hotbed of invention, uh, even in Falmouth. Uh, where the Smith brothers, Daniel Wheeler Swift and Henry D. Swift, good Quakers, invented the Eureka clothes ringer, uh, an elevator safety guard, a self-gumming envelope folding machine. Uh, but, you know, Americans were just all over the place inventing all kinds of that, things like that. Thanks for that to uh, Meg Costello from the Museum on the Green. Uh, so credit for just who did what often remains disputed to this day. Uh, here is John Logie Baird with his hand puppets, James and Stooky Bill. Uh, Baird is one of many said to have invented television, mechanical television that is, uh, and to peruse the internet is to gain the idea that everything in the world was invented uh, by, an uh, by the English, which is to say a Scotsman. Uh, we are often just as arrogant. Yet every one of the inventions I've written about, every one of these devices, structures, remedies, systems, styles, enterprises, and entertainments were fully realized in America. If they were not wholly invented in the United States, it was here that they were made commercially viable, widespread, affordable, beloved, indispensable. In America, the ingenious, we've included many things that are not generally included in, in books about inventions, uh, blues and jazz, um, the, Tennessee, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waterhouse, uh, the cities of New York, Chicago, um, and Los Angeles. Why not? They were invented by people just as much as anything else in this book, and they are constantly cited by other peoples as some of our greatest creations. But of all these inventions, but all of these inventions and many more are inextricably linked to the American experiment. They were made possible by the character of our country. So what did we do right? Six big things, I think. The six uh, the big six, six keys to our inventiveness that I could identify. First, freedom. Yes, you did build that. Sorry, President Obama. Uh, what, uh, what comes across at every turn in studying the history of American innovation is that this is what free men and women can do when afforded the liberty to pursue whatever mad scheme they wish whether it's the genius of an Alexander Graham Bell or William LeBaron Jenny uh, or, the, or the late Dr. Patricia Bath, who invented the laser phaco, the tool by which we remove cataracts, the dogged persistence of a Thomas Edison um, or a Samuel Morse uh, or Matty Knight, uh, inventor of the paper bag, the entrepreneurship of an, of an Andrew Carnegie um, or a Henry Ford, or Ellen Louise Curtis, AKA Madame Demarest, who found a way to, address, to invent the dress pattern business and use it to fight slavery. The courage of a Neil Armstrong. Um, sorry, oh, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. you missed a little there. Uh, the, the courage of, it, of a Neil, yeah. okay, I have to go back a little bit here. Uh, Neil Armstrong. Um, or a Walter Reed. Okay. Sorry, a little, a little mechanical glitch here. Um, uh, okay, or, or Dr. Charles Booth, who came up with the process to, in, to blood transfusions to the battlefield. The capitalist vision 
of an A.P. Giannini or a Cyrus Field, of Betty Nesmith, uh, who made whiteout a household word, the dazzling aesthetic of a Frederick Thompson who, who built Luna Park out in Coney Island, the most beautiful amusement park there ever was, or an Emil Everson, who invented some of our most incredible movie palaces uh, and invented the, the Brennograph machine in order to imitate an enchanted nightfall across those palace ceilings, complete with fleecy cloud effects. Um, even the sheer exasperating eccentricity of a Walter Hunt, um, inventor, oh, sorry, that's the fleecy cloud effects. Okay, but Walter Hunt, inventor of almost everything, uh, right down um, to the safety pin. Uh, with all of them, the value of the individual shines through. It was in America more than any place else in the world where these individuals could find the freedom and the encouragement and the capital to go where their dreams could take them. The vision of the transcontinental railroad was promoted more assiduously than anyone else in the beginning by Asa Whitney, a dry goods merchant in New York City, who saw that it would, quote, place us in the center of the world, compelling Europe on one side and Asia and Africa on the other to pass through us. This at a moment in history when it seemed completely impossible that Africa and Asia would ever be major trading partners with us. Um, the Erie Canal sprung originally from the mind of one Jesse Hawley, who had only what education you could get in a one-room free schoolhouse back in 1800. Hawley was a bankrupt flour merchant who ended up in debtor's prison in Geneva, New York, because he could not get his goods to market on time along the awful privately owned toll roads of upstate New York. But in America, the ideas of such ordinary individuals and such extraordinary thinkers could be heard as well as anyone else's. Key number two, we all built that. Sorry, Republicans. I, I think one or two of these guys is still in office. Uh, obvious heroes, and they are heroes, uh, beyond the obvious heroes, and they are heroes. I have tried here as well to demonstrate how much we owe to the countless unnamed individuals who made our progress a reality. The generations of anonymous pioneers who gave us the Conestoga wagon, then adapted it into the prairie schooner of the course of decades, one of the great examples of low-tech invention ever perfected. Uh, the trail of extraordinary craftsmen along the 18th century frontier who gave us the Pennsylvania long rifle did so much to win the revolution. The fearless Chinese railroad workers who lowered themselves down the rock walls of the Sierras to set off glass tubes of nitroglycerin and blow out the tunnels for the transcontinental railroad. The nameless Irish navvies who dug out the Erie Canal by hand. Uh, the black and white sandhogs, one of the first integrated workforces in America, who risked the bends every day as they built a railroad, a railway network beneath New York's rivers that is used to this day. The rivet gangs of Irish and Native Americans who welded together our skyscrapers in their dance with death hundreds of feet above the sidewalk. Their contributions and those of countless others were as valuable as anyone's in making us what we are today. Number three, government matters. Rugged individualism aside, the history of American invention shows again and again that government, which, is, which in a democracy means all of us, is vital. How does government matter? First, government is needed to set the rules. It's a myth that we Americans only lately became a litigious people. Uh, the famous Hatfield-McCoy feud, it took place over 28 years and killed 15 people. But the two clans sued each other hundreds, maybe even thousands of times over everything, no matter how minor. As late as 2002, they were still suing each other over access to a cemetery. Americans have long been the most litigious people on earth, and we are never quicker to go to court than when we think someone is taking a million dollar idea. Excuse me. It took government patent law to settle and resolve 
what otherwise would have been stultifying endless legal battles involving dozens of litigants over just who invented the cotton gin, uh, the mechanical reaper, uh, the automobile, uh, the phonograph, and the movie projector, among many, many other things. It's not something we want to believe today, but again and again, it's been up to the government to prevent powerful and ruthless forces from ripping off individual inventors and giving them their due. It was the federal judiciary that kept David Sarnoff and RCA from robbing Philo Farnsworth of, of credit for inventing electronic television. It took the courts to protect Elias Howe and his sewing machine patent when that brilliant thug, Isaac Singer, tried to literally beat him into submission. It took the judicial system to protect Dr. Raymond Madian's rights after his years of backbreaking work when General Electric brazenly tried to steal the MRI that he invented. In protecting the rights of the individual, the government delivered not, just, not only justice, but encouragement and hope to untold numbers of future inventors. Setting the rules has also meant stopping monopoly power with all sorts of wonderful unintended consequences. Federal antitrust laws forced the breakup of Standard Oil and thereby loosed 10,000 wildcatters across the land and spurred the incredible oil strike at a little Texas hill called Spindletop. Um, that's a Spindletop at its peak, it might crowd it. Uh, after a team headed by William Shockley and Stanley Morgan developed the transistor at Bell Labs in New Jersey in the late 18, 1940s, the Justice Department refused to let AT&T keep both its phone company monopoly and the patent in on transistors. Thus, in 1952, AT&T trained and licensed 25 domestic companies and 10 foreign companies to use the transistor for just $25,000 a pop. Uh, in honor of Alexander Graham Bell's lifetime devotion to finding a way for his wife to hear, incidentally, they gave the patent to any company working on methods to restore hearing, just gave it away. In the wake of this government mandated dissemination, William Shockley recruited many of the best and brightest engineers and physicists working with him and started Shockley Semiconductors in, in Palo Alto, California, opening Silicon Valley up for business. So what else does government do for us besides setting the rules? It provides the money. It does this in part by building what we take for granted today as one of the fundamental requirements of modern civilization, a universal system of public education. And let's hope we can take it for granted starting in September too. Uh, this was something else that was largely pioneered in the United States, something that was built from kindergarten through high school by a thousand small town school boards and city councils. This was President Lincoln signing the Morrill Act, which built our great land grant universities, uh, right through the grants and loans provided under Lyndon Johnson's Great Society that guaranteed widespread access to, to higher education. But here we're also talking about government directly subsidizing so many of our greatest developments and inventions. Uh, the men who built the Transcontinental Railroad were not willing to lay a single foot of rail without government guarantees that all but assured they would not lose money. Our national government provided them and pretty much every other railroad ever built with exactly that. The Transcontinental received 16000 to $48,000 a mile in government loans, about the equivalent of $3 billion in today's money. They also received 20 million free acres of land along the railroad route, which you can see there. Yeah, it's a lot of real estate. Um, indirectly, the federal government also subsidized the railroads with the Homestead Act, which handed out still more land, virtually free to anyone willing to work it, which meant a ready-made population for the railroads to cart out west and settle there. Now, it's true that throwing all that government money at a project led to an immense financial scandal, one that enmeshed at least nine senators and 13 congressmen from both major parties, including two vice presidents, a leading presidential contender and speaker of the House, and a future president. Uh, think of a single scandal engulfing uh, 
both Clintons, Andrew Cuomo, Tom Cotton, Mike Pence, Mitch McConnell, and Donald Trump. All right, so it's not so hard to imagine. You get my drift. Uh, who else was going to finance a railroad across 1,750 miles of empty desert and plains, not to mention the two greatest mountain ranges on the North American continent? Who was going to pay for that? Only the government. And in the end, all that scandal, all that pocketed or misused money was paid back a thousand, a hundred thousand times over by the ribbon of rail that tied a nation together. That enabled us to move tremendous numbers of people, and goods and mail and troops across the country and leave us with what is still today the best freight rail system in the world. Government backing was essential everywhere in the development of electric lighting and the telegraph uh, and the Hoover Dam. Uh, in the running of the space race and the Cold War, and all the attendant invention, inventions that created our electronic computerized world today. Government money was indispensable in building our great subway systems uh, and suspension bridges, um, the transatlantic cable and the Erie Canal, and it will be indispensable in building our future. That is to say, if we still want to build our future uh, in everything from solar energy to maglev transportation, to gene therapy, all developments that will continue to change our world for the better. Um, if you think Elon Musk or anyone else is going to get to Mars and build something there without massive government support, think again. Has this entailed picking winners? You bet it has. No one picked winners better than Abraham Lincoln, who not only gave us that nationwide rail system, but repeatedly overrode the bureaucracy of Civil War Washington to put weapons he liked into production. One of these was the Spencer repeating rifle, which he tested himself out on the Washington Mall. Or Teddy Roosevelt, who not only chose the engineers to build the Panama Canal, but also created the country they would build it through. Or Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon B. Johnson, I'm not sure who that other guy is in there, uh, who chose the firms and even the cities that would put a man on the moon. Government is unavoidable and it will pick winners, liberals, conservatives, no matter what they tell you. It's another reason why who you pick to pick the winners matters. Uh, so government sets the rules, it sponsors an educated workforce and it puts up the cash that allows private industry to take risks. Beyond all that though, important as it is, vital as it is, even more important is what government does to build the framework of capitalism. We see over and over again the great multiplier effect, the well thought out, well realized infrastructure, magic word infrastructure, we'll have infrastructure week someday, someday I know it. Uh, infrastructure has an enterprise and invention. By pushing the Erie Canal through to the Great Lakes, DeWitt Clinton put New York City in the cockpit of the Western world at the height of the Industrial Revolution, setting off an economic boom that lasted 150 years and making every town and city along the way a humming engine of, of commerce. To this day, 80% of everyone in New York State, an entity which stretches from the Atlantic Ocean almost to Ohio, lives within 25 miles of some part of the Erie Canal system. Uh, William Ogden, Chicago's first mayor, built his city into the nation's central industrial hub almost single-handedly, creating a network of steamship and railroad lines that connected it to pretty much everything, bringing in its stockyards and grain silos, getting its first great manufacturer, Cyrus McCormick, to set up shop with his reapers so that you had these shiny red farm machines going out on the railroads and all the bounty of the nation pouring back in. Uh, William Mulholland made modern Los Angeles bloom in the desert by bringing the water to it. On an even larger scale, Senator George Norris and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Republican and a Democrat, transformed the South by bringing the region cheap, abundant electricity via the, the remarkable arrangement that was and is the Tennessee Valley Authority. 
This was a lush, beautiful region of America that had been suffering under what seemed like almost a biblical array of curses since the Civil War and even before. Constant floods, disease, want, ignorance, deforestation, soil erosion, all problems that seemed wholly ineradicable. The TVA, which remains to this day the largest public power company in the United States, changed that almost overnight once its first great hydroelectric dams and power plants were in place. And not only or even mostly because it served as a massive public works program, which it did. Cheap public power and the TVA drove down the price of power all over the country, much to the chagrin of, of private utilities. Cheap public power meant that all of a sudden you had, an electric, you had electrical power. Think of how that must have felt going instantly from a nearly medieval existence to the 20th century. People can now buy electric stoves, ice boxes, refrigerators, washing machines, water heaters, all made available through low cost financing provided by the federal government's electric home and power. The nitrates the, the dams produced were used to rejuvenate the soil. The lakes they created became a major recreational and tourist draw. So were the forests that the government's Civilian Conservation Corps, a program for unemployed youths, replanted. Soon you could bring in the power lines and the air conditioning that made major business enterprises and mass manufacturing viable in the Deep South for the first time. You could start everything from auto factories to the Huntsville Space Center, to the music of Muscle Shoals, to the atomic power research labs at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they seem to be handing out uh, free atoms that day, I guess. My favorite unanticipated benefit was a small but vital one provided by a Tennessee librarian named Mary Utopia Topi Rothrock, who was charged with providing reading material for the workers who built the TVA. Toby Rothrock started public libraries where previously there were none. In general stores and filling stations and post offices, everywhere she could. 80 years later, those libraries remain permanent and much expanded, a testament to how much we don't even know we're doing for ourselves when we build for the future. What else? What else is key to our success in inventing so much? Number four, immigration is crucial. Over and over in researching America the ingenious, I was struck by just how much of this country was made by immigrants. Many of these, of course, were those anonymous men and women, free and enslaved, who did the hard work of hauling and digging, riveting and welding. But beyond arm and back, so many contributed their brains as well. There are 76 inventions in this book, and among their inventors are at least 65 immigrants and another 15 children of immigrants. What would America have been without them? I'm not just talking about the more famous ones, such as an Alexander Hamilton, or a Bell, or a Carnegie, or Giannini, or, or Henry Ford's uh, father, for that matter. But also Croatia's Anton Lucic, renamed Anthony Francis Lucas, who did so much to give us those oil rigs at Spindleton. Carl Breer, son of a German immigrant, who led a revolution in car design and made what was possibly uh, the most gorgeous automobile ever built, the Lincoln Zephyr, made possible the building of that. Uh, Slovakia's John Dopiria, who helped give us some of the first electric guitars. Or Richard Ho, son of an, an English immigrant printer, who gave us the rotary press and thus the modern newspaper. Or Jakob Yufes and Loeb Strauss, two young Jewish men who freed themselves from the yoke of European potentates, came to America changed their names to Jacob Davis and Levi Strauss and gave us blue jeans. The list of such immigrant contributions is almost endless in every field of endeavor, but nowhere are they more evident than in the decades long development of magnetic resonance imaging or the MRI. It began with the dedication of a remarkable young Jewish immigrant from Galicia, Isidore, born Israel Isaac Rabi, who liked to say, had we stayed in Europe, I probably would have become a tailor. Instead, because his family went to America, Robbie became a Nobel Prize winner and a quintessential American with an enduring love for the work of Jack London. 
Dr. Robbie gave us back so much more than he received, working and scraping to the point where as a student, his teeth began to fall out of his head from malnutrition. He went on to become one of the founders of the Brookhaven National Laboratory and the CERN Particle Physics Laboratory in Geneva and led one of the great, greatest university physics departments in, his, in, in, in our history, in, in mankind's history at Columbia University. There he passed on his work to colleagues who would come to include three more Nobel Prize uh, winners from immigrant families fleeing war and oppression in Europe. Felix Bloch and Arthur Shallow and Nicholas Bunbergen. Finally, their innovations were taken up by Dr. Raymond uh, Damadian, whose own family immigrated to the US from Armenia and who would bring Dr. Robbie's theories to practical fruition in the form of the MRI. All we got in return from these remarkable individuals uh, was that MRI, plus the satellites, uh, laser beams, um, uh, the microwave oven, and the space telescope. America's lifeblood is immigration, and to ever shut it off would be fatal. Number five, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. The oldest invention in America, the ingenious, is a sort of corn mill devised in 1715 by Dame Sibylla Masters, an immigrant from Bermuda to colonial Philadelphia. Dame Masters was also the first recorded woman inventor in American history, predating the United States itself. Her patent had to be filed in her husband's name. Under English law at the time, a woman could not patent anything in her own right. The earliest American patent for a dry cleaning process was earned in New York City by Thomas L. Jennings in 1821. It was also the first patent known to have been earned by an African American in our history. When it was granted, whites put up a hue and cry that no slave was allowed to hold a patent. They were not much mollified to learn that young Mr. Jennings had always been a free man. How many enslaved African Americans were deprived of the fruits of their labor for things they actually invented? How many women saw their achievements purloined by husbands, fathers, bosses. We shall never know, but it is instructive to note that where a hundred years ago, women could claim only 1% of all patents issued in the United States, today they earn 7%. Not nearly enough, but a big leap forward. The role of individual African-American inventors includes the likes of Dr. Charles Drew, who against almost impossible odds and ugly prejudice invented a system to get dried blood plasma to the battlefield and have it reconstituted there, saving countless lives in World War II. Dr. Patricia Bath, who emerged from a working class Harlem girlhood to invent a revolutionary advance in removing cataracts and healing eyes, her mother literally scrubbing floors to send her to medical school. But it is imperative to note as well, the innumerable men and women of color who gave what much of the world considers to be the very greatest of American accomplishments, our music, blues and jazz. Women were long held back from inventing anything much that was considered to be outside the realm of household economics, where at the most the office and the classroom. But even within these confines, they would still produce inventions that reshaped our lives. How many of us today would prefer to live without dishwashers? the disposable diaper, the paper bag. When they won a wider field for their skills, Margaret Heafield Hamilton produced not only the software engineering that took Apollo 11 to the moon, but the term software engineering. The synthetic fabric that constitutes bulletproof Kevlar vests was invented by Stephanie Louise Kowalik, not incidentally also the daughter of a Polish immigrant. It has to date saved the lives of an estimated 3,000 police officers. Pollock never saw a cent from an invention that probably earned her company several billion dollars, but she never seemed to regret that. I don't think there's anything to, like saving someone's life to bring you satisfaction and happiness, she liked to say. To broaden the pool of talent we already have is only to enrich us all. Key number six, it takes a village. Again and again, bringing brilliant and talented people together 
produces magic. This is not just true of American colleges and universities, though they've certainly played an invaluable role in so much that we have invented. It applies as well to all sorts of other more informal settings, some of them quite unexpected. It can mean simply those useful practical individuals willing to gather around and support someone fixated on an idea uh, by which I include their long suffering families. The tormented Samuel Morse was able to give us the telegraph, not only because of a generous government grant and, and another corrupt congressman, uh, but also because of friends and acquaintances who helped him every step of the way. Alfred Vail, a fellow congregant at Morse's church, not only got his father to invest $2,000 in 1840s money in Morse's invention, uh, but also let him build a working model of it at his ironworks. Uh, he then talked Morse into using the key that made the telegraph as easily heard as it was read and helped him develop the binary system of Morse code that is one reason why so many historians have called the telegraph the Victorian internet. A fellow NYU professor, Leonard Gale, introduced Morse to Joseph Henry, the leading scientific genius in America at the time, who in turn introduced Morse to the most powerful electromagnet extant, which he had invented. It meant a shrewd mechanic named Ezra Cornell, who convinced Morse to forget about burying his telegraph wires under the ground, where they kept shorting out and stringing them from pole to pole instead. Cornell's telegraph poles are a great metaphor right there for American ingenuity, one great enterprise sparking another. Ezra Cornell's farm and personal fortune would combine with a federal land grant to found Cornell University, of course, and seen here in its New York City incarnation on Roosevelt Island, putting out the technology of the future. Even the prickly Mr. Morris would use some of his money to co-found Vassar College in 1861 while Joseph Henry would go on to run the Smithsonian Institution for decades and turn it into a citadel of American knowledge and learning. He would also help to inspire the efforts of one of our greatest inventors, Alexander Graham Bell, whose Volta Labs would become an archetype of the research laboratory. And so it goes, on down through Edison's workshops, and Bell Labs, the Huntsville Space Center, Silicon Valley, Route 128 in, one, in Massachusetts, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the Microsoft Lab uh, campus in Washington State. Concentrations begun by government or corporate or individual initiative or by pure serendipity where all sorts of talented and intelligent people have created vital nodes of creation and commerce. The same can be said in their way for Detroit with the River Rouge here and the Midwest in the first decades of the automobile industry, the Mississippi Delta and New Orleans during the evolution of the blues and jazz, Chicago when the skyscraper began to rise, New York when America itself came into being. Proximity matters. Six key elements of invention. I'm sure there are more. Perhaps the truly singular thing about American ingenuity is how many different ways we've invented to trigger it individual initiative, collaboration, education, government funding, venture capital, immigration, innovation, hard work, obstinacy, obsession, persistence, irrational optimism, and the occasional earth-shaking epiphany. It all works, giving us a sort of built-in redundancy to our experiment in modern democracy. Despite how, how things may seem right now, with hard work and an awareness of how we have succeeded in the past, we will make it work again. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, um, I'll turn it back to Mark here. Thank you very, very much. And, and, and by the way, my sincere thanks to your wife for, uh, for keeping up all those slides. That, that was, that was, that was, that was great. great. He was terrific. <laughs> 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 oh, that was a woman yeah. right there. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm impressed. It's technologically um, difficult, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you obviously covered an, a tremendous spectrum of, of American inventors and a, and a whole realm of, of people. And, you know, look, I, I, I think any way that you can incorporate Levi Strauss and uh, Betty Nesmith, you know, and, and, and for those who uh, don't know who Betty Nesmith is, that's Mike Nesmith's mom from the Monkees. Yes, and, yes, and, uh, exactly. <laughs> um, 
um, she, she invented whiteout. Um, yeah, and, and and that you were able to 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 put and use the phrase that you know a, a low tech that not every invention has to be the microchip. Sometimes it's the paper bag or the paper clip. You know, um, what as you were compiling this list, there had to be some favorites that you that you that you really liked. I mean that um, uh, that you know that you uh, th that you really really wanted to to focus on who. It, it, who really jumped off the page to you? Who really resonated with you? Exactly. And and those things are, you know, they're all kind of amazing. Yeah, low tech, you know, like the Prairie Schooner was something, which is what I mentioned with that. It was like the size of an SUV, basically. You put all your possessions in it and you walked across half a continent in this thing. And you could, you know, take the top off it and get it across a river. You could bring it up mountains. The wheels were specially made so they could go up mountains and down. Uh, it's a tremendous bit of innovation. For me, one, you know, one of my favorites, of course, was Dr. Robbie, I, I. Robbie, who lived long enough to see his idea become the MRI, which is an amazing machine. So I love that whole thing. Uh, Walter Hunt is fascinating, the guy who invented the safety pin. He was constantly inventing amazing things and basically giving them away, you know, a sort of rifle, a... Uh, you know, a thing for uh, a, a way to the streetcars to signal or wagons to signal when they were turning corners to help pedestrians. Constantly coming out there, he comes, he, he invents the safety pin and he, he owes somebody $15 and he gives him the pit patent to, uh, to do that. Um, Mr. Otis inventing the, uh, the uh, Otis uh, elevator uh, was an amazing story that really helped make skyscrapers possible. And he was somebody who had gone through all the troubles of Job, you know, his wife had died. He was gonna take his kids and go out west, but uh, he starts working on this safety guard for an elevator. So you could, you know, go up and down safely and stop at floors. And he used to go out and demonstrate this at the Crystal Palace, uh, sort of it was like sort of a World's Fair thing in, in New York at the time. Uh, where you, and he would go up in this elevator and then cut the, um, the rope holding the elevator with an ax and everybody would gasp and the elevator would come down and his guard would stop it. And it was an amazing demonstration. So and he made you know, a, an amazing company uh, out of this. Uh, there, there are so many great stories in this. Um, and just a reminder for people, if you got a question down at the bottom of your, of your uh, of your computer, there's a, it says a chat. So type, so type yeah. in your questions there. Um, uh, I was, I thought it was clever that you, you, I never would have considered like the Tennessee Valley uh, Authority or the Moral Land Grant as inventions, and yet they were. You know that uh, yeah. as somebody who went to a Moral Land Grant college, who you know, yeah. somebody who's been down in the Tennessee Valley, and understands, you know how. Uh, how electricity is so important that that, that was I, I thought it was a in, very ingenious use of the word invention it wasn't always just the, the telegraph right right and that's the amazing thing you know and, and, and entire cities you know the whole thing with with chicago i mean it really is this vision of this one guy who goes out there to look at this land that his uh brother-in-law has has bought and this place is a dump it's this terrible swamp there are a few hundred people there who are usually half starved, um, but he sees the way to make it the centerpiece of America. Uh, it's an incredible story. We've got some questions coming in here. So, yeah. I understand that, that Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, but later learned that it was that it was Eli Whitney's sister who actually invented it. Was it because women could not apply for patents in those times? Uh, no, and it's not his sister. That's, I think, what uh, that question is referring to. And the, and the, the cotton gin was very uh, disputed. There were other people who claimed to have a cotton gin. And Eli Whitney went through, you know, years and years of litigation and finally won. But he got so disgusted with the process that instead he went to Springfield and became one of the entrepreneurs there who really went into making rifles and made most of his money off that. But he was an incredibly inventive guy. He went down south. He was going to be a, uh, a tutor. And the, the tutoring gig got canceled. 
But in the meantime, he fell in love with this woman named Kitty Green, who almost everybody did. Uh, she was she was the wife of uh, Nathaniel Green. I think that name is right. It could be no, anyway. Who was the uh, uh, one of the revolution the best revolutionary generals? And this uh, state of Georgia had given him a plantation in thanks for his um, service. And he went down there and promptly died of sunstroke. You know, we uh, we New Englanders don't do so so well in that kind of climate. Uh, but she was left with how to run this plantation. Uh, he fell in love with her, came and lived on the plantation, but it was too late. She was getting married to the overseer. But he starts, you know, she has this whole problem with cotton, with this, you know, uh, this certain type of cotton. It was just too, too um, time consuming and expensive, even with enslaved people, to, uh, to make profitable. So Eli Whitney goes ahead and comes up with this machine and invents the cotton chip. So, uh, you know, horribly in some ways, this is what actually makes, probably, probably kept slavery going for more years than it might have otherwise. And at the same point, he invents some of the rifles that are going to be used in the Civil War. So kind of the unintended consequences. But, um, but yeah, he, he was this Connecticut Yankee. He went down there. And because Kitty Green was a very bright and, and winning individual, some people think that she might have invented it or the rumor spread, but there doesn't seem to be any indication of that. He was, Whitney was just one of the, another one of these kind of mechanical geniuses, like uh, like those Falmouth uh, residents we were we were talking about before. Um, are most inventions today patented by individuals or corporations? That's a good question. I really don't know. I think probably corporations who have done you know moved up tremendously in you know getting smart, well-educated people to come on board and then, you know, getting part or all of their patents. Um, uh, sadly, there are fewer kind of, you know, garage guys working away and, uh, and coming up with patents on their own as there used to be, because um, it, it, it's harder now to, to do that. Um, but I'm sure there's still individuals patenting a lot of stuff. What about inventions that didn't work? Here in Massachusetts, the Hoosack Tunnel, the Worcester Providence, and Middlesex Canals. So you, you obviously detailed successes, or obviously not everything makes it. Oh, sure, you know, canals were a part, you know, after the Erie Canal, which was tr a tremendous idea and worked very well, uh, a kind of canal mania took over, and everybody was building canals everywhere, whether or not it was really profitable or a good idea. Um, you know, there were other things, you know, for instance, one of the things you always hear about is the flying car. Why don't we have flying? There are still people working on a flying car. The trouble with things like flying cars, and this is why a lot of inventions that don't get made don't work. And that, that would be a fascinating book too, what, what, what didn't work. But the, the elements that go into making a great car and a great plane are not the same, you know? And so you put those together and you end up with kind of a bad car and a bad plane. And plus, there's really just no point to it. You know, where are you going to come down with your plane? You know, uh, where it's, uh, you know, on the highway, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's all we need is like traffic at the skyscraper level. That would have to be completely computer controlled. So, um, you know, so this is, this is kind of not really a viable thing. Um, same thing with a, um, what must have been a terrific way to travel uh, on the um, the original Zeppelins and, and dirigibles, these airships, uh, which were br very briefly a great luxury way to go from Europe to America, must have been incredibly beautiful, like a like a cruise line in the air. But, but again, they weren't great flying devices, and there were you know constant accidents. And the Hindenburg was the most spectacular, but uh, so that was sort of the end of them. But. Um. Did you include Walt Disney and his mouse? In <laughs> uh, no, I don't have Walt Disney in here. I figured he was, you know, famous enough already. But he's another case. And he, what I do have is uh, Mr. Thompson, the inventor of kind of really the modern amusement park out at Coney Island, uh, Luna Park, which is incredibly beautiful. There were th three first real amusement parks were out there. And, you know, this is, these are one of the things that Disney uh, you know, to learn from and took from, uh, and, you know, in a, in, in a lot of ways. Um, 
this, this kind of goes a little bit to the flying car um, looking to yeah. the future. I see the future of innovation developing artificial intelligence and robotics to the point that humans will become redundant, like HAL to 2000, 2001. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you see artificial <laughs> intelligence as a problem. HAL didn't fare so well. Um, yeah, you know, it, there are various ways we could do it that would be disastrous. You know, people talk about the gray plague, you know, from making these nanobots, these tiny robots that would maybe, you know, get away from us and run amok. Uh, that would be awful. On the other hand, we could easily become, and probably will become, if we don't manage to blow ourselves up, to become um, uh, much more robotic. I mean, there are things, that they think of the things you could do to, you know, the things you already have. I mean, it's amazing to see what, um, you know, kind of these new mechanical legs are, how well they work. Um, think of that, you know, things to put in your brain that would uh, deal with, with uh, mental, uh, with, uh, you know, with brain injuries and all. Uh, we could become tremendously resilient as people if we use uh, this, this right. I don't think we have to really worry about, uh, you know, the robots taking over, although you never know. But uh, sometimes I think they should take over when I see what we do, what we're capable of doing as people. One of the one of the slides you mentioned is uh, yeah, the woman who invented dress patterns to help end slavery. What? Uh, t tell me more about that. Yeah, uh, Madame uh, Demarest. Um, I'm blanking on her name here, her real name, but that was the name she took up. She was this very young upstate New York woman who came to um, came to New York, uh, married this. Um, widower who was already like also in the, the dress business, she came up with the idea of making um, uh, paper patterns that you could then mail out across the country uh, and people would buy them for, you know, very little money and make dresses out of them. This is at a time, you know, before the Civil War when um, Americans, uh, you know, mostly made their own clothes. And so you can get these great, you know, the latest fashions from Paris and New York and wherever, you could go and get them and make them into dresses and all kinds of other things. So she puts out these big catalogs that advertise what's going on here. And as filler in between all the dress patterns, she has all these various essays and, and things on different developments of the day. And a lot of them are pressing for an end to slavery. Um, and she's a you know committed abolitionist. She and her husband, their firm is one of the, you know, almost the only one probably at the time where they hired uh, people of color as well as white people and paid them the same amount of money and gave them, you know, top positions as well. So she was really just a remarkable person, just ahead of her time. Um, how did you research all of this and how long did it take you? Uh, gosh, I, you know, I did it fairly fast. It was just, you know, there's a lot of it on the internet, um, a lot of it from other books, but, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. One of the great things of our time, the invention of the internet, the sense, you know, despite uh, whatever you might, you might see on Facebook on any given day, uh, the fact that you can get information that quickly, you know, it took me a matter of a few months, so. It was a lot of fun to do. I want to thank you very much for joining us. I want to thank your wife for being the uh, the, the, yes. the bionic, uh, the bionic yes. mouse there, the, 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 the yeah. clicking away. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully, the the weather that was in Plymouth is is will will miss Falmouth. Um, so um, again, uh, Kevin, thank you. Great luck. Uh, thank you so much for this. Great luck with this book. Um, thanks to your wife. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and our next lecture is next week. So um, thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, stay well. And you know, remember, eight yeah. cousins has copies of the book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can buy the book from uh, book, fine booksellers everywhere. And uh, you know, maybe next time I, I can make it up to found with myself. So love to thank do you so very much. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>